I want to just share with you today some things that I think uh, God can use in our lives. I'd like for you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, and uh, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. Chapter 6, 1 through 7. And it's an interesting story in the Old Testament. It says, Now the sons of the prophets said to El Elisha, Behold now the place before you where we are living. It's too limited for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, and each one of us take from there a beam, and let us make a place for us that we may live. And Elisha said, Go. Then one said, Please be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. And so he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they were cutting down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Master, Master, I borrowed this. The axe was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there. And he made the iron to float. And he said, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and he took it. Today I want to talk about when God changes our lives from a sinker to a swimmer. From a sinker to a swimmer. I didn't say stinker, I said sinker. Okay? We've got a few stinkers, I'm sure, but... The point I'm trying to make here today is uh, God has an amazing ability to take us from where we are to where he can bring us to. I'm so thankful that our God who made us can remake us. I'm so thankful that we may be down, but down is never our destiny. When you look at God's direction in the Bible over and over and over he talks about up and up and lifting us up and pulling our feet out of the miry clay and setting us on the rock. So God's direction is always upward. He is wanting to take us higher. He is wanting us to explore and to receive newer and greater visions. And so the thing that God is trying to help us to see today is that the enemy is the one who is trying to remove us and to remove our power, remove our effectiveness, and to get us sidetracked into a lot of other things. And so in the story we have before us, we have a group of, you might call them seminary students or Bible school students. They are the protégés following Elisha around. Elisha is probably one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. The anointing on Elisha was phenomenal. So much so that even after he died and they buried the man, that sometime later they were burying another man close to where his bones were. And when that dead man touched the bones of Elisha, he hopped up alive. Now that's power, that's anointing, <clears throat> even down to his bones. Well, I want you to know that he was teaching these young prophets, these young seminarians, what it meant to be a man of God. And they were following him, and the place they were staying just was too small. And so they decided that we need a bigger building. We need a building project. And so they asked Elisha about it, and he said, sounds good. We could use that. And so they said, they got together, formed their little group, and they said, we need to go over here to the Jordan where the trees are, and we'll, each one of us will take a, a beam, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll make a larger place. And so that was the plan. And then they asked Elisha, will you come with us? We need you on this. We'd like for you to be there. You see, they did not want to separate themselves from him. They wanted him to be with them, supervised, to be his, his very presence was very important to them. And he agreed. And so they were cutting trees. And one guy by the Jordan River, 
he was cutting down a tree with an axe. And as he came back to take a lick on the tree, the axe head flew off, went into the middle of the Jordan, and sank. That's what metal does in water. It sank into the murky, miry mud of the Jordan. And he was terrified because he had borrowed it. It wasn't his axe. It belonged to another. And he was so upset. He was thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I can't afford to get another axe. Now, axes back then, made of iron, were uh, put in between a split in a piece of wood, and then the leather was tied around it. And so you had to constantly be tightening the leather because the leather could stretch. And if you weren't careful, if you didn't keep it tight, it would get loose and fly off. And of course, this is what happened. And so the first thing he did was go to the man of God because he knew that the man of God was in touch with the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God would direct him what to do. And when he told Elisha what happened, Elisha says, take me to the place where you lost it. And so the young man takes Elisha there. He said it fell right here. It went in the water right here. Elisha does something strange. He cuts off a branch. He takes this branch, this piece of wood. He goes to the place where the iron axe head fell into the Jordan. And remember, what does the Jordan usually speak of in Scripture? Death. The River Jordan, we all oftentimes talk about when I cross the River Jordan. It's it's kind of a metaphor for, for dying. And into that spot, Elisha cast that wooden branch. And the Bible says, out of the muck and the mire, up rose this iron axe head. And it did more than float. Every translation carries with it the idea that it swam. (laughs) In other words, it came up, but then it came toward And Elisha says, reach out your hand and take it. And as he took it, it was now back to usefulness. Now, as I was thinking about this and I was listening and reading and going through this story, I began to think, Lord, what are you saying to us in in this, in this miracle? of the prophet and the iron axe head. And certain things just began to tumble into my mind as I began to think about that. I thought, you know, that axe handle, that represents my ministry and my giftedness. That handle is what I hold when I am doing God's work. They were doing a good thing, building a larger place so that they could be instructed a place to live. But in the process of doing, they lost something. He lost something in the process of doing. He wasn't careful about how tight the leather should be. He was probably a young man. Maybe he was not even familiar with how axes worked. He might not have known that you're supposed to really keep a close eye on this axe head. But as I was thinking about that, I was thinking that axe head, that represents the anointing of God. Because without God's anointing, all of my ministry, without the anointing, is just so much effort. Now I want to tell you, if you're trying to chop down a tree, you need to have an axe head. To go, at, you know, if you saw a guy out here wailing on a tree with an axe handle, you'd say, now there's a first class nut. There's something wrong with that boy. And you know, the boy had enough sense to quit. No sense keep beating on this tree with an axe handle. And I just wonder how many people 
they don't have the spiritual anointing of God. Oh, they're busy. They're making a lot of racket. They're out there swinging. They're thumping. But they have substituted work for worship. They have substituted doing for being. They have substituted effort for being in the presence of God. And I want to tell you this. You can put in a ton of effort, but if you don't have the anointing of God on your life, if you don't have the Spirit of God behind those efforts, it's like taking an axe handle and whacking on a tree. You may knock off a little bark every once in a while, but you're not going to fell any trees. You're not going to do anything permanent for the kingdom of God. You're not going to build anything. And I think sometimes we can get so busy for God that we don't spend time with God. And as a result, we lose the spirit of anointing. There is no substitute for the spirit of anointing. I remember in the early days when I was preaching, and Marilyn and I were talking about this the other day, when I want a good laugh or we, you know, we think about those early days of me preaching, which, you know, I try to forget that. She reminds me every once in a while. You know how God gives us wives to keep us humble? You know how that works? Don't you? And I remember those early days, and man, I remember I had all these notes from graduate school and seminary, and I was just whew, trying to find a sermon, trying to find something to say. And I would read books and outlines and all of that stuff, and I would get up in the pulpit and I would have my notes like this and I would be reading them just like this. It was sad, folks. I mean, it was really sad. And uh, I was doing that. And I remember one lady a few weeks after that, you know, when I finally got the courage to lift my head. Because believe it or not, my basic nature is to avoid people. Marilyn said when God called you in the ministry. I was worried about you because I knew you didn't like to be around crowds. You were not a people person. I thought, how's this going to work, God? Well, if she was thinking that, you ought to imagine what I was thinking. And one lady, after a few weeks, when I finally got up and looked around at the people, because when you look up and you see all these eyeballs staring at you, that's enough to intimidate you. And she said, well, I was wondering if we were ever going to see anything but the top of your head. <laughs> Somebody said, oh, I wish we could have some cassette tapes of those first early sermons. No, you don't. No, you don't. Then something happened. Then something happened. I remember, I remember... And God sent me through some, some real, real difficult times. Helping me to understand that without him I could do nothing. And I remember being on my bedroom floor, flat on my face, crying out to God over and over again, just laying prostrate before the Lord and I was saying, God, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. You made a mistake. And you and I both know I didn't want to do this to start with. And for a year and a half, I fought against God on this whole business. And it's like, no, I, this is not where I want to go. This is not what I want to do with my life. But I said, if this is what you want, I've got to have something I don't have. I've got to have something I don't have. And you know, God was teaching me that without the anointing of his Holy Spirit, you are just so much noise. And your sermons are just dry tongue. And the leaves of your notes are nothing more than like the dead leaves of the fall blowing in the wind. I needed something I did not 
have. Degrees? Yeah. I've got five of them. That doesn't make me a preacher. That doesn't make me a preacher. You can be an educated idiot. You know, I mean, I'm just... <laughs> and since I've been through the halls of a lot of universities and college, I will tell you, I've met a few. <laughs> Having a PhD or any other thing behind your name doesn't mean you're a wise person. And there's no substitute. You cannot substitute education for the anointing. You should have both. Should have both. But don't rely on this to the exclusion of this. You can't do it. You're like this young man who's whacking, whacking, whacking. And there was times when I was preaching, and I, I would come home, and I'd say, I feel, like, I feel like I'm trying to cut down trees with a rubber axe. I said that so many times. Just bounce, bounce, bounce. I told my wife on more than one occasion, you know, I think an organ grinder with a trained monkey pop in a cassette and crank it, and the monkey could sit there and do all of the... I said, I think he'd do a better job up there on the platform than me. I mean, I, you talk about being down on yourself. I was down on myself. Why? Because I was depending on myself. When you depend on the flesh, you get what the flesh can give you. When you depend on the Holy Spirit, you get what the Holy Spirit can give you. And the difference is the difference between life and death. So here's a young man. He's learning some lessons the hard way. He's learning some lessons the hard way. He loses the axe head. He should have been more careful. And here's one of the points I want to make. Before the axe head got lost, it got loose. Think about that. Before the axe head ever got lost, it got loose. I want to share something with you. Before a person falls into moral failure, before a person decides they're going to leave church, leave their faith, usually it's kind of like a flat tire I had one on the car I had. I, I just bought a, some tires for it. I hated going out into the garage because there's that flat tire. I'd get my compressor, air it back up, drive it a while, and then it'd go down. You see, backsliding is not a blowout. It's a slow leak. And what happens is, is that you don't notice it until the air is gone. You see, he wasn't careful. He hadn't been keeping up with tightening the leather straps. He hadn't been careful to keep things tight. He, he was not careful. And things began to get loose, and he did not know it. I have talked to people who have fallen into moral sin, and I remember one preacher who was in his late 50s who got into moral sin, and he made this statement, I never ever thought, he thought, he said, I thought at this age, I don't have to worry about that. That was until Miss Fluffyhead walked in one day, batted a few doe eyes, and bingo, bango. The guy who thought he couldn't did. See what I'm saying? When you're not careful, when you're not keeping the straps tight, things get loose in your life. You begin to listen to the wrong things. You begin to let the internet steal your soul from you. You begin to let the voices of the world determine your core beliefs. And today we're finding people who call themselves Christians that are accepting so many things as okay when God has said, this is not my plan for you. 
And so as a result, the straps get loose and they lose the cutting edge. They lose the anointing. They lose that which puts power in the punch. They lose that influence. Didn't say they weren't serving. I'm just saying their serving was now fruitless. It wasn't really anointed. And so as I read this, I'm saying, oh God, help us to take a spiritual inventory. Every once in a while, we need to stop and take a spiritual inventory. And we need to tighten our grip on God. We need to make sure that our walk with God and the anointing of God. You say, well, preacher, you keep talking about anointing. What does that mean? What is the anointing? The anointing is the power and the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in your life that is so free to move that your flesh is no longer front and center, but God is. Now you're depending not on your self-effort. You're not depending now. You are saying, God, without you, I can do nothing. I need the anointing. This morning, as I do every Sunday morning, before I come out to preach, I always say these words or something similar to them. I say, God, today we're in a great endeavor. We're standing before the souls of men and women, teenagers, boys and girls. We are people where people are watching us on the internet, live stream, YouTube. We are speaking to literally hundreds of people. Father God, if you do not go with me, Spirit of God, if your power does not flow through me, it will produce nothing. So, Holy Spirit, today in this divine partnership, I want to do what you want to do. I ask you to use my mind, my tongue, my preparation, everything I've done. But Lord, you use it, you take over, and you speak into the hearts of your people with anointing and power. You see, folks, on the day of Pentecost, the fire fell. The fire fell. And I want you to know that we need to have the fire of God burning in our hearts and on the altar of our souls to where that others can see the light of God in us. And when we pray and when we minister in the name of Jesus, God can work through us because we are totally dependent upon him. I remind God every day, God, I cannot live this day without you. I need the anointing. I need the cutting edge. People will come into my life today and I need to be sensitive to the Spirit to say to them what they need to hear from heaven. I need to be your voice today. And I'll tell you something. When you surrender yourself to God and you ask God to fill you with his Spirit, I mean, if you're serious, God's serious. And so do that inventory. Tighten your grip on God because when you get loose, it'll just be a matter of time before you start losing. You'll start losing the things that matter most. You'll start losing your influence. You'll start losing effectiveness. You start losing relationships. You lose the blessing of God, which is the biggest loss. And I've, I've thought about this today, and this week, Marilyn and I were talking about some things out of the book of Malachi. And I was thinking about how this happens to us so easy. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, Malachi 2, 17, this is an interesting verse. He's talking to God's people. He's not talking to heathen and pagans. He's talking to God's people in Malachi 2.17. Notice what he says. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Now think about that a moment. The Bible over and over again says we are to bless the Lord. We are to praise his holy name. We are to come before his presence with thanksgiving. 
We are to be a blessing to God. But God says there are times when your words weary me. And I thought about that. Marilyn and I were talking about this week. This week, wearying God with our words. Now, the word weary in the Hebrew language appears 25 times in the Old Testament. 25 times. There's only two times when it refers to God. There's this passage and the passage in Isaiah. And in that passage, God also says that you weary me with your complaining. Now, when I looked at that, and I look at this verse, and it says, you ask, how have we wearied him? This is the sad part. People don't even know. They don't even understand. They're not close enough to God to even know that what they're saying is not helpful, productive, spiritual, godly. And you notice there's two extremes here. God answers the question. Here's how you have burdened my heart. Two ways. He said, you say everyone who does what is evil is good in the Lord's sight. And he's delighted with them. And the other thing he says that you've done on the other side, the other extreme, he says, where is the God of justice? Now, there were three things that Malachi, God actually addressed to the prophet Malachi that was bringing the people to this kind of a state. One, Malachi was talking about apathetic priest. Let me say this, that as the priests go, so go the people. Here you had the spiritual leaders that were apathetic. They didn't teach the Word of God as the Word of God. They did not stand in the gap. When people offered a sacrifice, fine if they didn't, fine. If they offered a sacrifice, here comes somebody in who has a sheep that's blind and lame and really kind of the run of the litter probably needs to, I would normally kill it, but hey, let's give it to God. Kind of let's give God our leftovers. Let's give God our junk. And they come before the priest offering this, this poor thing, useless, of no value. They offer it to the priest, and they say, I want to give that to God. And the priest says, yeah, okay. You know, somebody might give a cat. Now, for you cat lovers, I'm sorry. I just threw that out. But, you know, God requires certain kinds of animals for sacrifice. But somebody might bring an animal that's not required, and the priest says, yeah, that's okay. Throw it in the fire. You see, what was happening was they were degrading the specialness, the holiness, the justice of God in the sight of the people. And so as the priesthood became more and more, okay, I'm going to use it, liberal, the people became more and more spiritually apathetic. And so the first thing that you see here in this passage is that because they were not upholding the word of God as the word because they were not upholding the standard that God had given the people became apathetic because the priest was and so they began to complain they began to complain they also complained too because the priest weren't preaching God's standards and the moral fabric was falling apart. Divorces were rampant. People were intermarrying into non-believers, pagans, idol worshipers. And the whole spiritual fabric of society was being pulled apart, threadbare. And so as a result of a lack of firm, biblical, godly preaching from the spiritual leaders... They go down, people are going down, the moral fabric of society is going down, people are violating marriage laws, what God had said, don't intermingle with non-believers. He still says that, by the way. 
I know we think we can change them. But God says, don't go down that route. I want to save you some heartache. And then the third thing is, he says, you weary me because you're so self-righteous. You're so self-righteous. He says, here's what you're saying. You're, on the one hand, you're saying, God doesn't care about sin anymore. And God doesn't care about marriage standards. God doesn't care anymore about how people live. Or God doesn't care anymore if you choose to live an alternative lifestyle. God doesn't care anymore if you want to have a little new age mixed in with your belief system. God doesn't care about those things anymore. That's on the one side. In other words, they were seeing sin rampant. They were seeing people who practice sin get away with it. They were seeing people who live such immoral lives seem to be blessed. So they came to the conclusion, well, I guess God doesn't really care about sin after all. It doesn't really matter. Live the way you want to. And God says that kind of thinking wearies my spirit because you are accusing me of being unrighteous. He said, I want you to know there is coming a day when I'm going to balance the books. And just because it seems like somebody's getting away with something now doesn't mean they're ultimately going to get away with it. God says, I am a God of mercy. And I am long-suffering. I thought about that this morning, the long-suffering of God. Did you know God allowed the world to get down to eight people in the days of Noah? Eight. Talk about mercy. Talk about long-suffering. He allowed things to reduce down to eight people before he stepped in. And just because you don't see God dealing with sin today, listen, listen, doesn't mean he's not going to deal with sin. As a matter of fact, in chapter 3 of Malachi, he says, I'm going to tell you something that's just going to blow your mind. I'm going to send a forerunner to prepare the way for my son, Messiah. He's going to deal with sin once and for all to make a way for us to have a relationship with God, with me. So God is dealing with sin. He dealt with sin at the cross. And so then on the other side, you have the self-righteous, you know, who are saying, I guess God's not just because it seems like evil prevails. It seems like wrong reigns. It seems like that the whole world seems to be headed in the direction of hell and God's not doing anything. Suffering is everywhere. God should stop it. If there is a God, why does he allow this to happen? He needs to deal with sinners. That was on the other extreme. I always thought about that. I thought, you know, you ought to be careful. When you say, God, deal with sinners. Well, you just put yourself in the crosshairs. You know what I say? Lord, I don't know about them, but be merciful to me, a sinner. Isn't that it? Focus on me. Quit focusing on other people. And so the thing that I want to say to us today is that Malachi is saying God is going to deal with all of this in his time and in his way. Well, God has a way of dealing with things in grace and mercy. Going back to our dear seminarian who is standing on the bank, lost his axe head. It has sunk down into the mire. It is lost. It's covered over by the river of death. There is no way to retrieve it. <laughs> no way. And yet, the prophet of God comes and he takes a branch. And what does he do? He goes to the place of death where there's a lost axe head. He throws that branch into that river 
And that which was lost in the muck and the mire and the mud begins to rise. It begins to feel the pull of an upward pull. It begins to do something it cannot do on its own. All of a sudden, we begin to see that a miracle is taking place. That that which has no strength all of a sudden has a strength it did not possess, for it came from the outside. It came from the strength of the branch. And the branch cast into that sea of death. That which was lost in the river of death is now coming alive. It is floating up to the top. It fills the pull of God to come up. Come up out of the murk and mire. Come up out of the depths. Come up to the surface. And then it was retrieved for usefulness. Folks, I want to tell you, I don't know what muck and mire you're stuck in today. I don't know you listening to me today if there's someone out there who's thinking you want to take your life I say to you listen to me this message is for you you have a God who loves you and he can pull you up out of the muck and mire you are in and give you a life and usefulness and you can make a difference. Of the power of the branch, <laughs> the power of the cross. I don't know what's got a hold on you, but when you throw in the power of the cross, there's a greater power that takes over. That which is impossible is now possible. Oh, I reminded of that old song. How many of you remember that old song? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. From the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're stuck in. I don't know what's pulling you down. I don't know how lost you may feel, but I want you to know love was demonstrated on the cross in the form of the Son of God. He died that you might live. He gave his life to pull you up out of that, that you might have a new life. You say that takes a miracle. That's what he specializes in. He is a miracle, working, life-changing, destiny-determining God. You have someone who cares for you, and he will not let go of you. And so today I want to say that in Christ, in Christ, he has made me the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. My desire is no longer to plunge to the depths of the muck and the mire, to the lowest places I can find. I've been transformed. I've been renewed. My mind is in the Word of God, and God has called me His Son. That makes me somebody. I am going somewhere, and I am going to do something for God with my life because He has rescued me, and He will do the same for you. So today, as I close the message, I care not the mistakes that you've made in the past. And I do not want you to spend a lot of time looking over your shoulder because that's not the direction you're going in. That's not the direction God is taking you. The cross, that's God's power for restoration. And this morning, you may be down, but down is not your destiny. You have a new destiny. As a child of God, you say, well, preacher, how do I have this new destiny? How can I know that I'm going to heaven? Listen, Christ died on that cross for your sin. Your sin was placed on him. And when he died, he paid the penalty so that a just and holy God could look no longer upon your sin but to see you as forgiven because it was all 
taken away. The penalty for your sin was taken away. You were offered eternal life because of what Christ did. He was buried. He rose again to prove that he was who he claimed to be, that he could do what he promised to do. You say, how can I have this? You just call upon him and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Give me the eternal life that you've promised. I want to make you Lord of my life. I believe you died on that cross for my sin. You were buried and you rose again to prove that you were who you claimed to be. I turn my life over to you. Be my Lord and Savior. Folks, if you mean that in that instant, you have a new destiny. You have a new life. You have a new beginning. The old axe head now floats to the top. It is now useful. It is now for service. It is now something the master can use to build his kingdom with. God bless you. Thank you all for coming this morning. I pray that God has spoken to many hearts today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, help us today to tighten our grip. Tighten our grip on you. Tighten our grip on the truth. May we not let the lies, the people who say, where is the God of justice? May we not allow those who say there is no God. May we not allow those who say God doesn't care. May we strengthen our grip on the truth of your word and not be afraid to speak truth into the lives of those who need to hear it. Oh, Father God, reclaim today. Reclaim. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Let's all stand in here if we would. and We'll be up front for those of you who want to come and have prayer. We will have our mask. We will try to maintain distance, but don't let that keep you from coming. Maybe you just want to come and pray. Listen, any decision the Spirit of God is calling upon you to make, if today's the day of return, we invite you to come today. Come to Him.